I'm doing an interactive workshop. I don't like to uh, yammer at people. Actually, I pr personally, I prefer it, but you're the one under the gun. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. no, 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 no. I use Socratic method. Y'all are under the gun. <laughs> <laughs> All y'all. Good morning, Heidi. I'm Amy. Nice to meet you. And I have hit record. I have to unmute myself. Sorry. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Good and morning. I don't know, Heidi, if you just heard Amy say that we're going to stay unmuted unless, of course, Harriet starts barking. Okay. Um, but if you have questions, just kind of shout them out and she'll... No, no, we're not going to shout out questions, but oh. we'll, we'll be... I'll give you times to talk. Oh, okay. Perfect. And it'll be, it'll be throughout. Okay. Good morning, Tim. I see your name at least. <laughs> There's another Tim. We Hi, good morning. We have oh, Tim Squared now. Try to get my uh, camera going here in a sec. We have Tim's growing exponentially. Yes. <laughs> you want to just take it away and as people start <clears throat> or continue to flow into the room, I'll let them in. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much for being here, Amy. As as I've said, I, I truly, truly appreciate it. And um, I'm not certain that I'm not one of those people that didn't throw you in the diversity and inclusion category. So it'll be interesting to hear how inclusive your yeah, program Yeah, yeah. Uh, I appreciate you um, kind of naming that. I, people, it's a natural place to, to put my work is in diversity and inclusion. Uh, however, because we have similar outcomes, the, the intent there is to include people and actually um, a colleague of color said to me, included in what? And I'm like, mm-hmm, that's why I don't teach inclusion, I teach belonging. Because people don't want to be assimilated into a dominant culture. People want to feel like they belong and that they're part of a team. And so that's the skill set of cultural intelligence. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, Jennifer. And good morning, Terry. If you can turn on your camera, it would be awesome because I do a participatory sort of workshop. All right. Terry's on the side. I love that. Hi, Hi Terry. Jennifer. <laughs> Hi, Jennifer. There we go. There Thank you are. For, <laughs> Thank you, Terry, for straightening me out. I, I kind of needed that adjustment. <laughs> You're muted. Y'all, if we stay a small group, we'll, I'll give you opportunities to share your ideas. Uh, if it gets to be a big group, we'll, I'll have you put your answers in a, in a chat box. I'm gonna do a share screen. Assuming is it doing it? It's gonna happen. Okay. There it is. Yay. So for big picture people, you get to see kind of where we're headed. There we go. So how to navigate cross-cultural conversations. Ew, valuing diversity, let's make the case. Why would we have different perspectives around? So this is our agenda for the next 30 minutes. I'm gonna do a quick warm up. I'm gonna tell you a story because I'm a teacher and that's what we do. I'm also a mom, right? I've got four kids, Ooh, storytelling's in the blood. We're gonna develop some common vocabulary because anytime a group of people come together and you're developing a, a common culture, you need to have language that um, kind of rocks and works together. We're gonna talk about what blocks people from connecting from that uh, belonging that Lisa, you and I were just mentioning. We're gonna discover what we can do to unblock. And I'm gonna ask you for a one word summary, how you're feeling now. So, um, I'm going to turn off the, I'm going to turn off screen share for just, no, Let, how about let's try chat box. Let's see how that works. So what makes it so hard to talk with people that are different and different can be, be um, can be, gosh, in, in St. Louis, we're, we're very concerned about race. So what makes it so hard to talk with people who are a different race or a different generation, a different gender, a different Oh, department, right? Or somebody in your department. Ew, maybe you're not getting along. What makes it so hard to talk with people who have a different perspective or background? 
put that in your chat box, please. Sherry said um, linguistics are difficult to interpret. Yeah. Hold on one second. Why am I not seeing the chat? I got to pull it up. There it is. Yeah. Got it. Sherry said linguistics are different and that means the vocabulary is not the same. Mm -hmm. now, and, and I love you, Sherry, because you set me up for developing common vocabulary. You rock. <laughs> Tim said fear of saying something wrong that might offend. Amen, Tim. Um, Jennifer said how people interpret your words. Yeah, how people hear you. That's huge. Heidi says lack of experience and that someone that's different um, which can lead to fear. Yeah, we, uh, particularly those of us that identify with the dominant culture or in the United States, we say dominant white culture. Ah, we, we just don't have any experience around talking with people that are different. Um, Sherry said, I don't wanna look stupid. Oh, I love you, Sherry, just call it out. I don't wanna look stupid either. Although I look dumb every day in this work, I get humiliated in some way or another and it's, darn it, a learning opportunity. Jennifer said, it's hard to do over technology versus in person. You lose that body language. Well, I actually like teaching now virtually more than because it really encourages people to speak up. And in an environment of belonging, people are gonna have to share what's going on from, from the inside out. And so if people can um, be encouraged when you're teaching and when you're presenting to share how, what's going on, all the better all the better. Okay, all y'all nailed it. It's this lack of experience, this uncomfortableness. That's beautiful. All y'all nailed it. Because I'm in Missouri, all y'all is a <laughs> is a word. So I'm going to tell you a story. And here's kind of the thing that I want you to keep in mind. When we're talking with people who have a different perspective, and we're uncomfortable and we don't wanna screw up. And it's just awkward because we lack vocabulary and experience. Our impact is actually gonna be more important than our intent. So let me tell you a story. I've got my notes in front of me so I don't miss a really good point. During a, a workshop that I was facilitating in a corporation, Jeff, a mid-level retail manager, he called me over to his group. He wanted to ask me a question. So it was one of those breakout sessions. And he said he wanted to, he wanted to know if he, had, um, if he should have taken down the Confederate flag. And I asked him, you know, where's the flag? And he said, well, it's up on the wall in my garage. So I asked him, what's the problem? Well, he told me that it took up the better part of the back wall of his garage. And when the door was up, the neighbors could see it. Um, I could imagine that that could be a problem, but I was curious about what prompted him to put it up. So I asked, you know, why, help me understand the flag and, and, and it must be important to you if it's up. And he said, yeah, it represents part of US history and my own history. So if it's important to you, why does it need to come down? Well, he explained, well, after the workshop last week, I got to thinking about what you'd said that our impact is more important than our intent in cross-cultural relationships, right? Well, because my neighbor is black and I'm white, I didn't wanna hurt his feelings. So Jeff told me he took down the flag and he said, now I don't know if I did the right thing because I was more concerned about my intent than my impact at that point. Well, I told him, you know, he'd take this great first step in building a relationship with his neighbor. He was thinking now about the impact of his actions. But Jeff wasn't so sure if it helped to take it down. I said, did you ask him? And he looked at me kind of sheepishly because of like all those ideas that you gave me, he said, I wouldn't know what to say. And I said to him, well, what about saying what you just said to me? I took down my Confederate flag in the garage because I thought it might hurt your feelings. What was the impact of the flag on you? And he said, I can say that? I said, sure. He nodded, turned back to his group. Well, at the next workshop, he didn't say anything. I really wanted to know what happened, right? Um, so when there was this break, I, I went and asked him, you know, what's going on? He said, I never asked him. I just decided that the flag wasn't that important. And, and it's partly because we've been getting together for beer and barbecue every Sunday, our families together. and that's what's more important to me. All right. 
facilitator out, right? So I stepped back and he circled back after the workshop later that morning. And he said, um, I just thinking about the situation, I just wanted to tell you, thank you. I'd never known before that if I check my impact on other people, I can learn how I'm coming across and, and I can have relationships that I never imagined before. And I'm like, that is so cool. I'm like tears in our eyes, right? And it was interesting that he never asked and dang it, I wanted him to ask and find out, but that really, it wasn't the point. And, and this facilitator had to grow up a little bit and just kind of let it go and, and realize that um, he had gotten the lesson that he needed to get. So when we're talking about cross-cultural relationships, we're using a term that um, Tim and I, Tim Michael and I yesterday were talking and he had to use the word culture. And he said, a lot of people use that word and it can get old. So let's get it defined. So we've got this vocabulary, right? So in your chat box, would you put what's culture? Define it for you. Give me a word or two for culture. Well, I can see Sherry thinking she actually looked up when she was thinking. <laughs> yes, yes. Um. What word comes to mind when you think of the word culture? Tim, I see you not typing in your, in your chat box. Cut it out. It... Sherry said a historical perspective that is commonly shared. Heidi said traditions, history, food, geographic location. Nice. Mary said collective personality. Yeah, I love that. It's a collect. Nobody, Mary has ever said that to me. It is definitely a collective personality. Um, Tim said a consistent way an organization, an organization acts, whether it's intentionally or inadvertently, that is so true. Jennifer says it's how your team is when leadership isn't there. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And one lead, and who sets that in motion is the leadership, right? Terry says human intellect and achievement, mm -hmm. definitely elements of culture. Let me uh, get this defined as more come in, that's legit. So here's culture. Here's a, a simple definition. Culture, <laughs> kind of like a personality, but for a group of people, it's a set of values, attitudes, goals, behaviors that a group has in common. It's as simple as that. And there are two elements. There's visible culture and invisible culture. And for those of you who are graphically oriented like me, I, I am visually oriented, right? And so I love this iceberg model. Here's the visible culture, all the stuff we can see, language, food, rituals, laws, institutions, behaviors, right? And so you've got, well, if you think about it, people love to go to Chinatown in San Francisco. People love to go to Little Italy in New York City. My, my daughter lives in Brooklyn and, and she loves to go to different ethnic neighborhoods, right? We love visible culture as human beings. What we don't like is invisible culture because we can't see it. It's below the surface. Norms, values, perceptions, our assumptions, they're all sitting there and they're not seen. And it's where most intercultural misunderstanding, most conflict between departments, between genders or generations or races, this is what's going down. It's what's below the surface. This is the part that's upsetting. I can't see it. We can't put our hands around it. Can't, it's like trying to wrap, um, trying to understand cultures, like trying to put your arms around a cloud, right? You can't, but you can feel it the moment you walk in the room. There's two types of culture around the world, not just in the United States, but around the world. Think about this. Every country in the world, every organization has a majority culture, a group that it's the most powerful, influential, widespread in the organization. Think about a school. Think about your business. Think about a country. It's a group of people. They have a majority culture who's dictating the laws, right? Who's dictating those norms, those things that we can't see. And every organization in the world has minority cultures. 
a distinct group that coexists, but subordinate to the more dominant group. And, and minority can be defined as race, nationality, gender, caste, religion, orientation, disability, appearance, all of it. And they're not making the rules. Much more aware of the dominant cultural rules and values because they got to navigate it every day to survive. Where those of us that identify with the majority culture, we're not so aware of our cultural values and perception. It's just so normal for us. We don't have to think about it. So when somebody said, why is it awkward to talk with somebody across different, it, it's just plain awkward. Well, it's partly because those of us that are majorities, um, we're just not aware of, of how we're coming across to people and our norms and values because they just kind of work for us. Puts us in a kind of an awkward position. May I make a comment, Amy? Sure, Sherry. I had a uh, MBA student uh, years ago from South Africa and she came up to me and she said, am I a minority? And I just thought, you know, in her country, she wasn't. Uh, how? In what way did she identify? Um, well, well, she just started noticing that there were a lot of different rules um, uh, for Americans in terms of how, she, you know, how they treated her than how she was treated in South Africa. Got it. Is, was she black or white? He was black. Yeah. So in, in South Africa, you've got it's interesting because majority and minority, I love that you brought that up, Sherry. Majority and minority aren't determined by numbers, okay. right? So in the state of California, Hispanics outnumber whites, but white people are the ones that are in the majority culture making the rules. And the same thing in South Africa, the majority culture, the one making the rules are actually white South Africans, right? That are descendants from the Dutch. And Afrikaans is actually a Dutch language. My husband grew up in Holland and he speaks Dutch and when he comes across a South African, they can communicate. They are the ones that set the rules and even the language in play in that country, even though blacks far outnumber whites. That's a really good point. So then what is cultural intelligence? Well, and, and here it is, right? This is what I teach. Ability to appreciate a different perspective and adapt your behavior to show genuine respect just to, to appreciate their differences, their uniqueness, their stories. And isn't this what happened with Jeff and his neighbor? He appreciated the fact for the first time that his black neighbor might have a different perspective. And he adjusted his behavior to show his black neighbor who comes from a different culture genuine respect, because he realized that that flag could have a very different impression. Well, it's the same thing between a man and a woman. A man might not be aware that one in five women on the planet will be sexually assaulted at some point in their lives versus one in 71 men. So there's a 20% chance that if you compliment a, woman on, compliment a woman on her appearance, that it'll be perceived as a threat. And that puts a minority person in a very awkward position they may not want to speak up. So what can a man do? Because we need to hear men's voices. We don't want them minimized. A man actually asked me that. I don't understand. In light of Me Too movement, I can't even give a woman a compliment. I'm just not going to say anything. I'm like, well, dude, that's actually going to make it worse. We need to hear your voice, right? 70% of voices that we hear in popular media around the world are male voices, predominantly white. Your voice counts. We need to hear. You need to mentor women. Well, what do I say? And I said, well, how about complimenting her work instead of her wardrobe? Oh. And then if you give a woman a compliment and you're not sure it went down right, check your impact. How did those words come across to you? It's a really simple thing that we can do with cultural intelligence. And, and the whole point is that so everyone in the organization isn't just included, but people feel valued, heard, and engaged. And you know that leads to more productivity, right? You know that leads to more innovation when people know that their values and, and their perceptions and their assumptions are gonna be heard. 
So what blocks us from valuing and hearing people? Could you put that in your chat box? What do you think blocks us from hearing people? Um, Tim said arrogance. Tim, Michael said assumptions. Sherry said assumptions, yeah. Another word for assumptions, y'all, is bias. The way we've been enculturated may keep us from hearing the way somebody else has been enculturated. Can get in the way. Heidi said strong feelings that I or they are right. Yeah, they can totally block us. Bingo. How is it that I, I mean, Lisa, I don't know how many people we have online and nobody's giving wrong answers. Terry said, perception that the individual based of the individual based on appearance. Yeah, your perception of somebody can block you. That's bias. Sherry said, not being aware that people have different perspectives. Amen. So this is what's going on. All y'all are right, because most of us are in this if there are five stages of cultural intelligence, and when I go into an organization, we actually start with empirical data. When, when people go, you know, I'd love to be more diverse and I'd like to include more people. I wanna reach a broader market. Amy, I just don't know where to start. Well, we're gonna start with the IDI, right? We're gonna get some empirical data. Dominant culture in the United States loves their empirical data. It's not Amy's opinion. Let's get, let's get the data set and find out where you and your organization are on this spectrum. Are you in a monocultural mindset of denial? Which means you just miss differences. It's not intentional. You grew up maybe in a Waterloo, Illinois, white working class area, and you've never been exposed to people who are different. You might be in denial. You might, you or your organization might be in polarization. And polarization is exactly what it sounds. People speak in a way that's polarizing. And, and the way that sounds is broad brushstrokes. Oh, well, you know those people up there or well, women drivers, right? Broad brushstrokes that are alienating because it kind of sticks you in a box. People in polarization use kind of us versus them language. It can be hurtful, but where most of us are around the world is in minimization. This is what we do. In fact, we've got the IDI has been back translated into 11 languages. It's used globally and around the world, two thirds of the people that take the IDI show up in minimization. This is a global cultural default. We diminish each other in conversation. Have you ever heard a parent say, ah, oh, get up, you're fine. That's minimization. When somebody tries to silver, silver line your pain, oh my God, he's failing out of school. What, you know, at least Elizabeth's doing okay. That's minimization. It means you're not seeing someone. The last two stages of cultural intelligence, which are the multicultural mindsets, the place that we want to be if you want to reach a broader market, is acceptance and adaptation, where we allow people to be where they are and eventually adapt our behavior to show respect. Kind of like checking your impact, accepting the fact that you and your neighbor have different perspectives and that you could temporarily adjust your behavior so that you can connect with them. It's this, so to answer your point, when I asked what blocks strong feelings, the bias, the arrogance, the assumptions, not being aware of other perspectives, that's because we're in collectively the stage of minimization. I don't know if it's because of our Anglo tradition, you know, the British stiff upper lip. Well, in the United States, we've basically got an attitude. We've adopted an attitude that I think comes right down from that, the suck it up. That's minimization. When you hear people say, I don't see color, that's kind of like me saying to Mary, I don't see your womanhood. Your color, your religion, your gender, your generation is part of who you are and we don't want to diminish it. 
You actually need to name it, acknowledge it. And then that elephant can walk right out of the room and you can connect with a person. Those are the five stages. I just thought I'd let you know how minimization shows up a little bit more because this is what's blocking us when those assumptions show up. The really cool thing about this stage is we do recognize our essential humanity. Like Sherry was talking about, uh, we all want the best for our kids. We wanna do well in our jobs. That's something that minimization's got going for it. And people in minimization seek to avoid stereotyping. That's a good thing. This is the bummer part. We tend to assume that everyone's like us, kind of like a man assuming that a woman, a compliment would feel good for everyone. Well, we actually need to check. Everyone does not have our experience. And another bummer part about minimization is we avoid conflict. We actually grow because of tension. And we've almost demonized conflict in dominant white culture in the United States. We actually want conflict in our organization. It just needs to be managed well. When people are emotional, it's because they feel passion. We need to hear them out, not diminish them. So I'll ask you to put in your chat box, how can, how can minimization inadvertently or intentionally impact your colleagues, clients, or your children? Think about your Thanksgiving dinner table. Sherry said, feel threatened, hide from me or I hide from them. Yeah, there's a lot of hiding going on in organizations where minimization is systemically practiced. Uh, Lisa said, people feel ignored. Yep, talk about impacting collaboration and innovation. Tim says, not understanding the path that took them to get to this point when we don't hear them out. Jennifer said, feel like their voices isn't as strong in a conversation or decision. They feel unempowered. Yeah. It's beautiful. You guys get it. And, and now that you know minimization is our cultural default, watch yourself today and this week and at the Thanksgiving table. Watch yourself get caught up in minimizing you and your experience. And this is something when I'm debriefing with women, a lot of women haven't taken the time to think about how they're inadvertently minimizing themselves. If, if you think about it, if 70% of voices that we hear on the planet in popular media are male, and even though girls learn um, vocabulary and their voice develops earlier in childhood, it's male voices that dominate classroom chatter and playground chatter by first grade. Women get interrupted in meetings twice as much as men do. So it kind of communicates, it doesn't kind of, it communicates to women, you're not quite worth hearing. So that internalized the minimization is not worth speaking up. And they don't have to speak up in an aggressive way, but they can certainly find their voice and watch yourself, men and women alike, how you diminish your participation to fit in to the larger culture. Heidi says, for me, I'm a financial planner. People feel like they don't have enough money. They should know this stuff and it freezes them from taking control of their finances. Heidi, that's a beautiful example. When you feel like you have to know it all and you can't speak from your heart or your concerns, it can shut you down from hearing the solution. That's a great impact on clients. So how do we talk with people who have different perspectives? I've got, beyond checking for impact, I've got one other little tidbit to share with you. I want you to stop. It's an acronym. I want you to slow down. Somebody says something at that Thanksgiving dinner table that gets your ire up. Slow down and take three breaths, deep breaths. Just slow the whole conversation down. Observe your reaction and the feelings of others. Check that y'all are safe. I don't want you to enter into any conversation where you're not psychologically or physically safe. If everything's cool, I want you to proceed 
with curiosity and wonder into that conversation. I want you to stop. And this is what it sounds like. With, if you're safe in a space and you can leave behind, who was it that said earlier that need to be right? You can ask questions. You can check your impact. You can ask somebody, what's their story? Um, who was it that said I, earlier in the chat box that finding out somebody's experience and check how they're feeling. How did you come to that conclusion? You don't wanna ask why questions because why is kind of like a, a hot burner on a stove. Don't touch it. It makes people defensive. Ask what or how. Oh, what was your experience? How did you get there? Tell me about your story. Those are questions you wanna ask that keep a conversation open. So I'm trying to start a cultural intelligence movement if you haven't figured it out. It's a little bit my passion showing up here, right? So things you can do are, I do a workshop series, usually about once a year. I'll do one probably starting the first week in February that you can join. It's a series of five workshops that really build these skills. And it's a less expensive way if your organization wants to join it, a number of people. You can read my blog. I write a monthly blog. Connect with me on LinkedIn, or you can take the IDI and find your stage of cultural intelligence. So how does expressing cultural intelligence help us reach a broader market? But it is, it's time, Lisa. It's eight o'clock. So if you don't mind, instead of asking that last question, you've got some tips. I would appreciate if you give me your one word summary. But I'm gonna stop the share so that we can see each other. Can you all tell me what, how you're feeling right now? What's your one word summary for what you've heard? Unmute y'all. Sherry said hopeful. Don't have one word. <laughs> Do you have a sentence for me, Gerald? Um, no, I, I don't. I mean, it's, it's all great stuff. Um, it's processing. Um, I like the stop. That was a good, good ending part. Um, yeah. You know, basically, it's stop and think before you speak. And by the way, what does the P stand for? Proceed with curiosity and wonder. Or caution. Well, caution could be part of it. Caution can also play out as minimization if you're not careful. Well, you can, if you proceed with curiosity and wonder, you decenter the conversation and it's about them. If you make it about you, you better proceed with caution. But if you make it about them, tell me about your experience. What was the impact of my words? Caution can um, fall away and empathy takes its place. Caution kind of goes in the camp of political correctness. I'm not in love with political correctness. I'd rather you be compassionate for okay. someone's context. Well, I like the idea that you also said conflict isn't bad. I grew up with four sisters. We had plenty of conflict. Sure. <laughs> and I do everything in my power to avoid conflict. So that I think enough. that's how man minimization manifests itself is this conflict of, in working class culture in minority cultures, they don't avoid conflict. So often white people will be trying to understand why we can't speak with people of you know, African-American culture or um, working class culture. And it's because we've got this conflict avoidance and people who just lean right into conflict and we don't know what to do with it. Well, the solution is hearing somebody out. It's stopping. Well, that's, I, I was thinking of, of three words as opposed to one, which was listen, really listen. Uh, it was really kind of where I was at. It's not just listening, but it's really listening. That's actually um, so important, Tim, that I've got a whole workshop on active listening because for some reason, you think I'm teaching rocket science, but people don't know how to deeply listen and decenter a conversation. They, the, uh, those of us that are part of the white majority culture, they'll say, oh, I've had that experience and then launch into their own story. And the minority doesn't have the power to say, wait, can you hear me? They're not in a position of power. 
So if we can recognize that we're the ones that are in the position of power and go, no, wait, I can shut my mouth, <laughs> like Gerald is saying for a little while and hear someone out. It's the same between a man and a woman. The man can recognize that they're in the position of power, a white and a black person or a, a parent and a child. Also, uh, what state you're from, because in, in New York, I, I run across a lot of people who are very assertive and very truthful and they're in your face. And that exact same behavior in the Midwest is considered rude, but in New York, that's considered normal. But if I, from the Midwest, go to New York, I'm called a wimp and a liar because I'm not telling the truth because I don't have a voice. Sure, and, I and you. so you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> It's so true. Yeah, I used to live in New York and I live in St. Louis now. And uh, particularly as a woman, people actually, Amy, can you soften that? I'm like, really? All right, I'm in the Midwest and I'm female. So people want me to be soft. But, you know, it doesn't take much to bring out the Brooklyn. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good. Anybody else have? Questions or question comments. Amy, do you have Amy? Do you have train the trainer uh, workshops that takes this message out on a broader basis? Yeah. yeah, I modify the the five workshops I do. I basically shift into participant observer mode and ask people to watch me teaching and critique my teaching as much as participate. And then we break that down at the end of the last 10, 15 minutes of every workshop, we break down what I'm doing and how I'm doing it so that um, they can then take that and put it in. Yeah, train the trainer is, if you are modeling the kind of teaching that you expect, train the trainer is a natural oh, outcome. <laughs> See, there's the grown up word. Yeah, oh, outcome. <laughs> Amy, this is recorded and it'll go up on our YouTube channel. For those of us who aren't here, but listening later, can you share how to reach you and, and what's the best mode of contact and all the, that kind of thing? Oh, thank you. Thank you for offering. You can reach me through my website, amy at empoweringpartners.com or the website is, what do the people do? www.empoweringpartners.com. Pretty straightforward. And on there is information about the IDI, if you'd like to take the IDI and also uh, how to reach me and my blog. I write a blog every month, <clears throat> excuse me. And for people who wanna know how to navigate and negotiate really practical tips, kind of like stop, those, those techniques and tips show up in my blog. In fact, this month is going to be talking turkey. Mm. Oh. <laughs> well, as you were talking about different things, I was saying, you know, while you're talking about a company, this does apply to everyday life and how we don't know what we don't know. And yeah. When, but what's, what's really important, Lisa, is we recognize that the work starts within, feeling compassion for ourselves, not minimizing ourselves, which enables us, because how we show up for ourselves is how we show up for other people. And, and Sherry's actually in the business of coaching and, and she, she knows this. So making sure we're not minimizing ourselves, that we are caring for ourselves and seeing ourselves allows us to do that for other people. And once we get people to that point, now we can start talking about organizational change. Right. So Excellent. cool. Such a cool opportunity, especially in an individualistic society like ours. We don't see systems. We don't see cultural systems. So, um, but individuals make up those cultures. So I got to take care of these individuals first or train the trainer to do that. Perfect. Got to go. Thank you very much, Amy and Lisa for organizing this. Of course. Thank and, and Amy, thank you so much for doing this. And Excellent. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it, y'all. Thank you. We'll all talk soon. Can't wait. Oh, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy Turkey Day. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. All right, bye. Yeah.